Hear me, guardian of the holy fire. Your enemy, the cold, has felled Norahoy. Send help, send fire. Send it by your messengers, the Tanifa. From the sea, send up your fire. Oh, my sister, help me. Send inland the fire. It was in answer to the priest Naturoi Rangi's chanted desperate appeal, according to New Zealand legend, that a broad band of subterranean fire spread in from the coast, through Rotorua, past Taupo Moana, to the heights of the central mountains. Fear of the sacred fire died down, and over many generations the Maori people lived beside it, making use of its heating power for their daily comfort. Later, blown by the wind from England, came ideas of using wind power, and also ideas for getting useful work out of numerous rivers. The new Kam Pākehā discovered coal, built steam engines. But hardly had he done so when the whole world started to move into the electric age. Even in these green and mountainous islands, however, the number of good hydroelectric sites is not unlimited. Where else for power? If only engineers could cap it, there's still plenty of driving force left in there. Crazy idea, volcanic power. And yet, in a small and common sense way, a start was made 20 or 30 years back. Such available hardware as this, dropped into a hot pool, acted as a heat exchanger. When clean water was circulated, the simple apparatus gave a free hot water service. Elsewhere in the world also, volcanic resources waited. Japan, California, Iceland, Italy, Mount Vesuvius. Can we cap that? Well, not exactly. But all the same, Italian engineers poking for borax through the hard Lardarello capping rock put down deep bores and won for their power stations supplies of good dry steam. On the New Zealand site are found no hard capping rocks to hold steam down, only an immense thickness of chaotic volcanic debris. Into understanding this area have gone some 40 years of quiet surface research, followed by aerial magnetic surveys. There are now enough facts concerning the Tapo area for scientists to hazard a guess about underlying bedrock. If we stripped off all the water and sedimentary stuff, we would find a great buried rift valley 12,000 feet deep, the Taupo Graben. To any geologist looking at this in section, it's obvious what has happened. About a million years ago, lie of the land was fairly flat round Tapo. Then two long cracks or faults opened up in the rock.
In a sense, nature has placed the needed cap over volcanoes in the floor of the Rift Valley. 12,000 feet of wet debris holds them down, and under this great pressure over the ages, their fires have boiled up vast quantities of superheated water. Buried lake beds have left impervious layers in some places, and in the general porous mass, circulation of heated water is slow. Not much heat or steam escapes to the surface, therefore. Not unless something happens, or unless something's done to release the pressure and flash the steam from the deep buried superheated water. down in the Graben has been tapped in several places by bores about 2,000 feet deep. Heat can also escape where openings have occurred naturally. Thus, when the summit was blown from the distant volcano Tarawera back in 1886, the world's largest boiling lake was produced by a great steam explosion six miles from the volcano. It would take 40 million watts to boil a kettle this size electrically, and yet natural heat has been boiling it for 75 years. To make sure that there's a similar continuity of power in the steam wells at Wairaki, each bore is left to discharge freely for a while before pipes are run to the powerhouse. Boiling water that comes up with the steam soon imitates the natural hot springs by depositing patterns of silica. Where noise is going to be a nuisance, the steam jet is split two ways, between the bases of twin hollow columns. The water drops out from these double-barreled spin-dry silences while the discharging steam rises in two counter-rotating spirals. If it's going to the powerhouse, the wet steam goes first through U-bend and cyclone separators. Water in the steam comes up in bursts rather than steadily. From the separators, it goes down into flumes, leaving dry steam ready for the pipelines. As more separators and silencers come into use, the many places where silica-loaded wet steam used to play on hillsides can be investigated. Wonderfully decorative plaster work is found, left festooned from the hard-boiled pine trees. Inside equipment, such deposits are quite a problem. Nothing is ever quite predictable on this battleground for power. Bore 26 has now been sealed off by massive pumping of cement, but it once brought down a hillside road by breaking to the surface outside its casing in a boiling eruption. Bore 204 was another place where wild horsepower refused to be harnessed. From the depths of her self-made crater lake, Bore 204 has been thundering away for months on end, keeping 40 acres of ground in a state of permanent earth tremor. The earliest to be utilized were small private bores. One in a Rotorua back garden helps with the cultivation of pineapples.
a full hot water service for 16 homes in the neighbourhood, as well as for the hot pipes around the glass houses, comes from the one bore through heat exchangers. Outside, raw steam from the bore goes into a donkey boiler to heat up clean, pure steam to sterilise soil boxes. The word hangi has a special meaning in Rotorua. In most of New Zealand, it means a Polynesian oven of stones, preheated by a wood fire. But here, it's a box set over a small, natural steam fumarole. Down towards the lake at Rotorua Hospital, steam substantially cuts down a big monthly coal bill. Tapped far below the hospital foundations, it's fed into a whole basement full of heat exchangers and storage tanks. A cooling waterfall. Geothermal water is too hot for some purposes. This 40-gallon drum wellhead equipment was homemade to separate steam for special use on a Taupo pig farm. Cooking for the trough is one use for steam at this piggery. A second well is being sunk to steam heat and wash out the large new pig houses. A local contractor runs the small truck-mounted drilling rig. The government's rigs at Wairaki are of the full-scale oil drilling pattern. After the bit has been changed, number two rig is running drill pipe. With shift working, three crews are required for each rig. It's just the sort of skilled and muscular job to appeal to the Kiwi temperament. Number one rig also, the drill is going deeper. A thing that oil drilling men would find unusual is that the mud put down the drill pipe to flush out cuttings from the bit comes back up again almost boiling. More solid records of what is down below are made by the progressive drilling out of cores of rock for the geologists. At number two rig, casing goes in. It keeps the drill hole clear and prevents steam from escaping into the porous rock. All the time, the output of completed bores is being tested. A travelling sampler moving from centre to edge of the jet measures a known percentage of the steam. Whereas the sampler measures a bit at a time, the giant calorimeter absorbs the lot, measuring the heat rise over a three minute period after condensing it in a thousand gallons of cold water. A cementing run at one of the rigs. 
pumped down the drill pipe, a pure cement slurry wells up round the casing to hold it down firmly in the surrounding pumps. Scratches on this smoked glass plate record temperatures down a drill pipe. The scratches are made by a needle deflected by expanding metal. This is the simplest and also the most successful depth thermometer that has been tried. The needle makes its scratches on the plate when the line is jerked. The depth where the temperature is highest is likely to be the most suitable level for steam production. Any move to a new area requires miles and miles of new roads through soft country. Easy to cut into, but difficult to stabilize. With another bore finished, number two rig sets out towards its next assignment. Visitors to Wairaki are sometimes lucky enough to have the controllers of the project show them around. The best time is when a new bore is due to be blown. There should be power enough in that new one alone to keep a small town going. But the search goes on by aerial magnetic survey. While it is only above ground that the eye can see volcanic craters, the aerial magnetometer puts rings round the buried ones too. Down on the ground, the survey gangs go driving through the rough keeping score of surface detail amongst boiling mud pools and other natural hazards. After the surveyors come the physicists. They measure the heat lost by natural causes from each acre of country. Here from an expanding fumarole. springs bring up chemicals dissolved from the rock below. Analysis enables chemists to offer their own special line of evidence about the underlying country. The results of these small operations control the big ones, selecting the best places for the next sinking of drill pipe and capital. While new drilling start, a hot creek from the old wells flows away. From a production field where 20 wells are kept, 
From separators rumbling at each wellhead, great looping, hissing, insulated pipelines set off downhill, charged with high-pressure steam. Pipelines join. Expansion loops in step, the growing ranks go marching down Wyora Valley. On towards the powerhouse on the bank of the cooling river. Smoothly Water from the flowing Waikato is drawn up through the wading pumping station into the first geothermal powerhouse. Down from the powerhouse and into Waikato, the condenser water outfalls back, enough of it to have cooled the steam for 69,000 kilowatts. How much more power waits? Though this is a big scheme, there should be room for many more like it. Just draw right back and see how small and alone it looks, this first one, sitting there on the pumicey surface of the great Taupo Graben.